Good afternoon, Jonathan, and thank you very much for giving some time to talk to The Mint. It's a pleasure. Brilliant. Well, um, I was obviously very struck by your recent book uh, about economics giving people a license to be bad. And I wanted to start with um, what started you out on examining this question? Well, I suppose uh, ever since I was a graduate student and I did a course on economics and philosophy, I started to realise how economics is and always has been a deeply ethical subject. What I mean by that, and of course a lot of people think economics is the opposite of an ethical subject, what I mean by economics being a deeply ethical subject is you can't do economics, economic analysis, economic theorising, reach economic policy conclusions without making ethical and indeed political assumptions. You have to, if you like, take sides, make ethical judgments. And if it looks like you're doing some kind of pure science without any of that, well, it's, it's a con, actually. There are always hidden ethical assumptions driving your analysis. Um, and in my PhD, I was looking at environmental valuation. I was looking at how, you know, this was kind of very early on in, in concerns about things like climate change. But I was, you know, I was looking at essentially at that question, you know, how serious should we take a particular environmental problem of pollution or climate change? How seriously should we take it? And can we kind of quantify in monetary terms um, the pros and cons of doing something about it? Or specifically, can we quantify in monetary terms the benefits that um, a, a clean environment or an unpolluted environment or, a, or an environment free of uh, dangerous climate change, can we quantify that in monetary terms? And of course, economists generally think we can. And I think that as soon as economists are answering, trying to answer those kind of questions, they're really answering the question, what kind of society do we want to live in? Um, you know, what sort of future society or environment do we want to leave our children well they there are obviously ethical questions so the idea that we can kind of somehow transform it into a narrow technical question about putting a money value on something yeah. is i think absurd i suppose what's interesting of course you a that philosophy that you, you have in the background to sort of see yeah. this and then that you went straight into or, or went into this question of valuation which sort of gets it full frontal doesn't it but yeah quite a lot of people who do economics, it sort of gets hidden, doesn't it? That uh, there is any values or ethics, Absolutely. you know, it sort of gets just tucked away in the yeah. initial assumptions. Well, or in terms of the terminology. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the definitions when, I mean, I'm not macroeconomist particularly, but when macroeconomists talk about voluntary unemployment and what they mean by that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the assumptions about human behaviour. Yeah. Um, they are, you know, they are, they are, they're assumptions, they're ethical assumptions, and they're also psychological assumptions. Um, and just, just the idea that economists so much focus on efficiency um, and don't talk about other values, whether it's equity or sustainability or so on. And again, they do that really without thinking about it. Now, I was amazed when I first came to economics, having studied philosophy and yeah. seeing that they took one version of ethics yeah. and applied it as if it was the answer. And in philosophy, no one would take the version yeah, of ethics. Yeah, I mean, you mean a kind of fairly crude version of utilitarianism. Yeah, no one held exactly. no one. I mean, it's, it's regarded as a joke yeah. in, in across philosophy. You know, philosophers don't agree about much, but crude utilitarianism, <laughs> they do agree, is a nonsense. Yes. And of course, it's all there in the history of economics. You know, Adam Smith, who was his greatest friend, David Hume. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, in Cambridge, where I'm from, the... Uh, uh, economics tripos until after the Second World War was called the Moral Sciences tripos. Okay, there was a very conscious and explicit awareness that this was a deeply philosophically laden subject. Yeah. It's really only post-war that somehow economists have become obsessed with seeing themselves as scientists yeah. of a sort that you know, in their in their self-image as scientists means you can't talk about values and you can't talk about ethics. So. Given that, is it almost by mistake that it's become a license to do bad, if you like, because that's sort of just ignored, or is it actually something more sinister behind that? I mean, we can talk about a um, simple example. Uh, it, uh, it's just astonishing that in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, um, 
there was this view that it was the fault of the regulators. Right. That was a quietly widely, quite widely held view that, you know, well, the, the regulators let the bankers get away with it. Well, I think that's like blaming the uh, police or the homeowner when your house gets burgled, you know? Yeah. Um, sure, um, uh, it would be better if there were more police on, on your street or if maybe if you'd uh, got more security. But let, let no one's, you know, when your house gets burgled, you know, the kind of moral responsibility <laughs> like, lies with the burglar. OK, and when um, when um, and what people say is they say, oh, yeah, but sure, you know, bankers will be bankers will be bankers. Right. Say. That idea that it's inevitable that people will be, um, you know, extremely selfish and will break every rule they can if they can get away with yeah. it. And there's no point in trying to kind of restrain one of these bankers because, you know, another one... Yes, st- we don't do it, someone else will. Exactly. If I don't rip off the system, somebody yeah, else will. And everybody's going to think like that. Yeah. So there's this idea that it's kind of natural and inevitable that people are uh, selfish and unrestrained by any yeah. kind of moral code at all. And so the idea is because that's a kind of given, then suddenly the, the, the responsibility and the blame lies with the regulators, which is a kind of absurd position. Yeah. to have got. So what we've done culturally with that is we've given the bankers a license to be bad. We've legitimated bad behaviour because we've said it's natural, it's smart, it's the rational yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Economists have really um, appropriated that word rational yeah. in various ways. It's the rational, natural, smart thing to do. But, you know, that's, that's an out, out there example. But I don't want people to kind of feel comfortable and smug here because actually some of what I'm talking about, it, it's touching on all of us in kind of everyday lives. Yeah. So one thing I'm interested in is um, the, the, the change that's happened over just a few generations. So if you look over, if you look at um, uh, the immediate post-war generation, you could say their motto was doing my bit, doing yeah. my bit yeah. in terms of the collective endeavour, the collective project, the tasks facing the community. Yeah. Um, and that meant you you did your bit and you saw the collective result and you thought, well, I, I was part of that. I helped bring it about to help make it happen. Right. But people don't think like that increasingly these days. And the reason they don't is filtered out from economics. What do people think now? People think, uh, what's in it for me? Or that more subtly, they think, well, if I don't do my bit, will it make any difference? Yeah. It makes no, and if it makes no difference whether or not I contribute because my contribution's too small, then why bother? Yeah. Okay. So why bother to vote? Why bother to do your recycling? Yeah. Why bother to view online content? Pay for online content when you can view it for free. Yeah. You know, it's it, it. You know, why bother to put money into the kind of honesty box for the coffee in the office if the, if my small contribution isn't going to make any difference? If it's going to, if the collective thing is going to happen anyway, then 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 why bother? And, and I that, want... that's free riding. That's what economists call free riding. Mm. And what's happened is that economists have. Um, come up with a theory that says free riding is the smart, rational thing to do. Yeah. They've legitimated that bad behaviour, and that's actually new. That's that's not that didn't exist within kind of you know the, the history of thought. If you go back a few generations ago, and is that are there actually statistics or trends or what's the sort of evidence base? I mean, obviously anecdotally that more makes sense. That is there actually a, an evidence base of uh, in terms of surveys or whatever that shows that. Uh, we could break it down yeah. and, and look. So there's in some interesting qualitative research in terms of if you get people to explain why they're doing what they're doing and, and that this idea. If you, I mean, most obviously in voting, this it comes up again and again. Yeah. People thinking in terms of well, what's the benefits to me and what's the cost to me and what and my vote doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Um, so that you know, so the evidence is there, but I do think it's. It would be surprising, wouldn't it, if a change like that had happened and that it was just a coincidence that there'd been, uh, you know, academic ideas that had, that had kind of filtered out the academy um, a few years before. And it was just a coincidence that mm. then, you know, I mean, again, you can, you can say, well, how do you prove that the kind of activities of the public choice economists are all saying all politicians are selfish, all bureaucrats are selfish, all voters are selfish. Um, How do you prove that that led to the kind of uh, disenchantment and the cynicism about politics? 
But the timing is perfect. If you look at when those ideas were filtering through in the late 70s, early 80s, and then you look at the um, emergence of, of widespread cynicism about politics. I also wonder, I mean, if you tracked, and I suppose now with social media and stuff, it might be possible yeah. to do, the use yeah. of the term incentive. Yeah, because absolutely. Because incentive is a brilliant word, isn't it? Because it's a highly technical economic yeah. Uh, uh, term. I mean, yeah. I think it's used in psychology as well. But yeah. the fact that now it's become common parlance. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and people, when you kind of push them, they say, "Well, it just means a, a motive." But it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Though. It no. means a lot more than that. We wouldn't talk about. Um, uh, oh, you know, uh, we give someone if if you you know. Um, uh, oh, uh, first in the race at the Olympics will give you a gold medal. So we give give, more, give gold medals to incentivise athletes to perform. <laughs> okay, we wouldn't say that. No, it makes no because, sense. Because that's not the right word. No. So incentive doesn't just mean a motivation. No. Um, yeah. I mean, other, where do I start? Really? Yeah. But, 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 I mean, one of course, of the things that economists have done is they've assumed really without, and again, it flies in the face of all the psychological evidence, Assume that all, there's kind of all kinds of motivations can be boiled down to one to a one-dimensional motivation, yeah. which can be expressed in monetary terms. Yeah. So this sort of idea that well, if we take away the intrinsic motivation that someone might have, the ethical motivation yeah. that someone might have to do something, the purpose, yeah. we can kind of compensate for that by giving them, a, offering them a, a wad of cash, offering them a financial carrot. That somehow we can, you know, balance up the loss of the one by offering more of the other. Um, and it, of makes, it doesn't work. It always, all, always seems to me makes people like puppets that you think you can. You just have Carrot. to. Well, I mean, you know, um, um, I think it was uh, Merleys, um, his uh, Nobel Prize winning um, uh, lecture was called "The Economics of Carrots and Sticks." Yeah. Anyway, he said he wrote a famous yeah. paper. He, you know, the cheating, as you say, carrots and sticks. Yeah, and that's it. And then people, you, know, you just sort of control people. Yeah, and then you wonder why people kind of react and rebel yeah. against yeah. that when they're treated like puppets. Yeah. It's I had hardly surprising. At, at uh, I organised an event once, and uh, there were sort of breakout groups discussions. And I suggested one discussion is: is there more to life than incentives? Uh, and, and people couldn't understand the question. Uh, it was quite a The only person who understood it was actually been in the army. Uh, and of course they said, yeah, well, of course, we were in the army. We, you know, we, we had a duty. We had, uh, you know, our fellow comrades who we were always supporting. We were part of a strong community. And obviously it was, you know, the incentives were not there at all. Yeah. And it, it was interesting. It took someone from that particular background to open up the conversation. And other people went... Ah, oh yes, yeah. I sort of see. But yeah. to start yeah. with, the question yeah. did not make sense to people. Yeah. yeah. So that idea in we, where we've kind of internalised a kind of weighing up of benefits and costs, that's really quite... And they didn't, meet, they didn't be in monetary terms, but this sort of weighing up of the, the benefits and costs to me, Yeah. this sort of, this sort of hidden selfishness of that, mm. that we kind of, in the way in which we think about decisions, and not just, uh, you know, economic decisions with a capital E, but decisions about, you know, what to do with our life, career choices mm. or, or, you know, family choices, these kind of things. Mm. And that's quite pernicious, really, and insidious. But there is, I, I think, I suppose the good news is there seems to be a backlash against that amongst the young. And actually, I'm told amongst employers are getting worried that the young are actually looking to go to social enterprises, you know, going and looking for purpose. Yeah. And actually, the mainstream um, organisations, employers, are finding it difficult to recruit the leading thinkers and so yeah. forth because they're not interested in going and working for this sort of organisations which have no purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's it's promising, isn't it? It's, it's going to be promising. Yeah. So, how would you, if we were looking forward and thinking, you know, what would an economics look like that actually? did seek to represent the fact that people actually do, and the evidence suggests, you know, want a purpose, have some sense of, you know, um, uh, being in a community or doing things collectively uh, and, and trying to reverse it, if you like, to sort of... Because if, if representing people as selfish is sort of fed into uh, the, the community in terms of making it sort of real, how do you sort of reverse that? Yeah. Right, well, good <laughs> question. <laughs> that I is mean, a very one, big question. One, one thing I'd say straight away is that um, 
if you have a much more complex picture of how humans think and their motivations and their values, you're not going to be able to represent human behaviour by a utility function, by this function that represents a person maximising this or maximising that. Yeah. Except in a kind of tautological way where yeah. they're maximising some, something and we don't know what it is and we sort of ex post. You know, except in some kind of um, tautology that doesn't tell us anything. So you're going to need a much richer, complex picture of human behaviour. And I don't think that's, in most cases, going to be amenable to mathematical modelling. So instead, you're going to, economics is going to look much more like case studies and institutional analysis. And of course, this, this was quite common in economics. Um, I mean, as recently as the 1950s and so on, it was, it was still quite common and this has sort of faded away since then. But if you, so you'd have, you know, it's, you'd have, a, I say, case studies of particular contexts, particular times and places, particular, you know, the labour market or the, this industrial sector or that, um, where you can, ha- and then you can get, you'd have economists, if you like, get, gathering their empirical evidence by going out, getting out there and getting their hands dirty, interviewing people yeah. and so on. Almost um, like anthropologists. I mean, actually, it's, yeah, I mean, maybe it's are. not a surprise that, you know, mm-hmm. one of the principal investigators at the Centre for Rebuilding Macroeconomics yeah. is Professor Laura Baer at LSE, yeah, yeah. an anthropologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you do sometimes feel that economists have been afraid of uh, sort of emperor's new clothes phenomenon. They've been afraid of talking to other social scientists um, because other social scientists are going to realise, actually, in so many questions, how little mainstream economists have really got to, got to offer them, yeah. how little they have to bring to the, bring to the table, really. Um, but if we if we look back in the history of economics, there's a very rich tradition, um, and and alternative perspectives in economics. So there's there is lots out there. Um, I mean, the other thing I'd say about what would an alternative economics look like, or uh, um, is in terms of the relationship between economic ideas and you know the rest of us, ordinary members of the public. Um, We've got to get away from this idea that economics is a science and that therefore it, it, there are models where there's a black box and an economist um, says, oh, well, you know, we can't explain the model, but the model says this. Yeah. The model says that's impossible. The model says this will happen. Um, instead, we, um, as non-economists, have got to be much more um, willing to challenge and 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 question what economists are telling us and expect them to be able to explain um, what's going on inside those models um, and uh, stop rather than this idea of, of, of economics being as a science that kind of looks down on on the the, home, the social world as like kind of you know Charles Darwin looked at beetles through his microscope yeah um, we've got to realise that our economists are in that world yes. and um, the theories and the analyses that they develop shape and affect that world and are affected by it. Yeah. So that, you know, um, that's one of the reasons that the kind of licence to be bad thing, the way in which um, by economists making assumptions about us being selfish and calculating and so on, that can be self-fulfilling. Yeah. That can have that effect. I mean... You know, that idea, again, you can see it in the world of politics. If we start to assume that all politicians are always um, selfish, um, if, if, if most voters assume that, then it becomes self-fulfilling because um, uh, the kind of politicians who uh, are trying to do something noble, if you like, won't get super they won't be believed and they won't get elected and they won't get the votes and so the kind of bad drives out the good and you have that self-fulfilling um ca- character there and and interestingly in the world of politics the politicians themselves have begun to internalize that kind mm. of economistic view of politics so that everyone's selfish so they basically said oh well, yeah i know that i can't be trusted so therefore one one of the things I'll do if you elect me is I'll give away my power, yes, my democratic yes. power, to some quango yeah. or some technical body. Hence the you know, across the political mainstream, the almost universal acceptance of independent central banks. Yeah. You know, we yeah. can't politicians we politicians, we can't be trusted, but it's all right, we'll give the power to these unelected people. Well, I mean, you know, that's not a, that's not a kind of 
an, an improvement to democracy. That's a, that's a rejection of democracy. Yeah. Um, and we're still saying that all the time. We're still trying to kind of again. It's about being afraid of talking about the values. It's, yeah. Let's that, let's not talk about values. Let's make it a kind of technocratic scientific problem, so we can give this quango the, the problem to solve. So really, I think it, what you're saying is we really need alternative stories and examples of where actually people act from a value, from a collective viewpoint, and actually create things that are positive and worthwhile that people can then sort of gather around and say, I want to be part of that and, and expand, recreate yeah. that. Yeah, sense. yeah. And that wanting to be part of it is, is important because rather than this idea of what's in it for me, well, you know, the benefits aren't worth the cost to me, the, the hassle, so I won't bother, I won't join in the kind of free rider thinking. Rather than that, that idea of being wanting to be part of change, um, I mean, we can kind of scoff maybe with hindsight, but if you remember the the, the, the kind of, the excitement around the election of Barack Obama. Yes. They had this word change. Yeah. One of the interesting things about that election was the the clear evidence that in the run-up to polling day, as it became really clear that he was going to win, okay, as it, as it moved, as we got closer and closer to the to the um, the date, um, to the election date, it became the evidence was starting to be overwhelming that he was going to win, and the kind of standard economic theory of how people think would mean that loads of people would think, well, what's the point then? I'll just stay at home. Yeah. But in fact, the turnout went up hugely and lots of people were saying, I want to be part of that. I want to be one of the people who help make that happen. Yeah. Rather than it being, well, will it make a difference whether I vote? No, it won't. I'll stay at home. And, and, and that tapping into that idea of, of, of wanting to be part of it, of wanting to do your bit rather than sort of weighing up benefits and costs and it's interesting it's that really important it's identity yeah identity politics and wanting to belong of course are growing yeah at a rate aren't they yeah. in a way that is obviously not always although sometimes positive. it can be exclusionary exactly yes you know it's 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 a kind of narrow vision of community that builds the wall around itself yeah. but therefore actually getting into that space and looking at the bad and the good and how you create a good form of community of belonging um seems to be incredibly urgent um, well, it's certainly urgent, isn't it? Um, I mean, if we think about something like climate change, um, you know, I'm, I'm pessimistic, to be honest. Um, I know that's not um, very helpful, but um, I think we've also got to be realistic. Um, um, unless we start treating it like uh, we're facing a kind of war situation, really, um, then then uh, it's going to be too late. Um, but, I mean, interestingly, on... on um, on uh, climate change, um, uh, the uh, there's, um, there's there's a discussion in the Economist of all places of of the Green New Deal idea, yeah. um, particularly associated with the Democrats in the US, and they and um, the whoever it was, the writer in the Economist, um, didn't dis- didn't it wasn't necessarily agreeing with it, but they put their finger. On, on exactly where um, economics falls down when it comes to thinking about climate change. They um, said, well, one way of thinking about the Green New Deal and the people around the Green New Deal, they, th- they think that tackling climate change using markets and taxation and carbon trading is a bit like trying to fight fascism with a fascism tax. Yes, and I that's heard that. exactly yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that idea we've got to get beyond. And again, it's that that if it goes back to the idea of seeing climate change as a kind of technocratic uh, problem in cost benefit analysis, you know, how much money do we spend? What are the benefits rather than it being um, an existential (laughs) challenge to humanity? I mean, it is astonishing. Um, So uh, we need to see it in, in, in that broader sense, of course. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I think that is a, to end on a, a really crucial point. Thank you. Thank you.